Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the Centennial Speaker Series of St. Joseph's College. We are proud to, um, to be hosting this series of speakers, both uh, distinguished speakers from off campus as well as uh, distinguished speakers uh, from campus, from our, our own faculty. In this, our 100th anniversary as an institution of Catholic and Mercy education founded by the Sisters of Mercy in Portland some 100 years ago. Uh, we have the, uh, the distinct privilege of uh, welcoming Father Monk Malloy this evening um, as our guest speaker. And uh, his presence today uh, has doubly blessed us uh, with the lacrosse win. Uh, the monks beat Emmanuel while Father Monk Malloy was with us watching the start of the game. So we want to thank him for, uh, for, for that encouragement. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, a distinguished member of the St. Joseph's College faculty um, who, um, through his good offices, uh, was responsible for inviting Father Malloy to this evening's uh, uh, Centennial Speaker Series. Um, Dr. Ed Riley has distinguished himself both here and in other institutions. He uh, came to us in 1975, I think he told me. 78. 78. And uh, in those years that he has been here, he has served uh, St. Joseph's College well. And we thank him for um, his uh, leadership. We thank him for the fact that he graduated from Notre Dame and was instrumental in getting Father Malloy to come here this evening. Ed. Before the uh, formal invitation, introduction, I want to just issue a couple invitations. Uh, after uh, Father Malloy's talk, he will be happy to entertain some questions. But I would ask you, if you have a question, to go to one of the two standing microphones They're on both sides. And that is so uh, we can all hear the question. Uh, the second invitation is for you to uh, stay around for a bit after the, the talk and the questions because we're going to have a reception right out here in the open area, a chance for some uh, refreshments and obviously a chance for you to get to meet Father Malloy. So please don't, don't rush away. Well, as an alumnus of the University of Notre Dame, I am uh, especially pleased to introduce our speaker tonight. As most of you know, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary as a college. The theme of our centennial celebration is realize the promise. Father Edward Monk Malloy has realized his promises in many ways for many years. For 18 years, concluding in 2005, Father Malloy served as president of the University of Notre Dame one of our nation's great universities, if I do say so myself, and uh, a model of what Catholic uh, higher education should be. During his years as president, he led Notre Dame through growth and academic reputation, the quality of its faculty, its financial aid resources, and in increasing the diversity of its student body and its faculty. At the same time, the university continued to deepen its Catholic identity. Even more uh, fundamentally, Father Malloy has realized the promise of his decision to become a Catholic priest. He was ordained in 1970 in the beautiful Sacred Heart Basilica on Notre Dame's campus. A Holy Cross a priest Father Malloy recalls in the first volume of his uh, memoirs, Monk's Tale, The Pilgrimage Begins, that the Eucharist had been sent, has been central in his spiritual life. He writes, as I reflected about priesthood in the wake of my ordination, I knew that my faith life had been nourished by regular and often daily participation in the Eucharist. Father Malloy began his pilgrimage, an appropriately spiritual term that appears in the subtitle of the first volume of his memoirs, on May 
1941 in Washington, D.C. As he advanced through school, he became an outstanding basketball player. As a senior, helping propel his high school team to the Washington City Championship and two postseason tournament championships. So our gym is a fitting setting for his talk tonight. I almost expect him to grab a basketball and sink a three-pointer. Uh, recruited heavily, the future father Malloy entered Notre Dame as a freshman in the fall of 1959. Thus began a relationship that continues today. He earned his bachelor's degree in English from Notre Dame in 1963 and a master's degree in English there in 1967, one year before I earned my master's in English at Notre Dame. While studying for the priesthood, he earned a master's in theology in 1969, and later he earned a doctorate in theology from Vanderbilt University. Father Malloy, since then, has continued to realize his promise in many ways, in addition to his accomplishments as Notre Dame's president. As a teacher, a theologian, a man of great compassion, a devoted servant of God, and helper of so many people. He has consistently promoted community service and aided the efforts of AmeriCorps, the Points of Light Foundation, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Campus Compact, and many other service organizations. On a very personal level, he donated a kidney to his nephew in 2008 and since then has advocated for organ transplantation. I could go on and on, but then we wouldn't have time to hear Father Malloy. Uh, before ending my introduction, however, I must answer one question that is surely on many people's minds. What about that nickname? As Father Malloy points out in his memoir, in the third or fourth grade, he began calling another boy, already nicknamed Bunky, Bunk. The other boy reciprocated with the name Monk because it rhymed with Bunk and alliterated with Malloy. Sounds like a future English major there too. A Monk Malloy's presence here seems especially fitting given our college nickname, which you see all over, the Monks. And it's really not true that we just changed that nickname two days ago. In closing, I quote from Father Malloy's second volume of memoirs, Monk's Tale, Waystations on the Journey. He writes near the end of the volume about facing the challenges of being president of the University of Notre Dame. Finally, my identity as a Holy Cross priest and as a theologian and my long involvement in the ongoing discussion about the nature of a Catholic university had set the stage for what would become the heart of my responsibility, remaining faithful to our distinctiveness as a Catholic university while being open to the inevitable changes in how we realized that goal over time. As we at St. Joseph's College embark on our second hundred years, we face a similar challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking on the topic, stories of heroes and heroines as the source of our hope and the grounds of our promise, University of Notre Dame, President Emeritus, Father Edward Monk Malloy. Thank you so much, and President Lomansky, and I've just had a very warm and welcome reception to your beautiful campus, and I'm delighted to be here. When I was a boy, young boy, I first wanted to be a garbage man because I admired what they did. They picked up heavy things, they rode around in trucks, 
and they did an important function. Later on, I thought I wanted to be a police officer. You get to wear a uniform, you have a badge, you can ride around with the lights on and the siren going. What could be more exciting than that? And then later, as I began to be more proficient in a number of sports, but particularly basketball, I began to desire to emulate successful athletes. There was a kid in my neighborhood who was six feet four and ended up being a very successful basketball player at Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I wanted to be six feet four and I wanted to have a jump shot like he did. I ended up being six foot three and I didn't have as good a jump shot, but I had a pretty good one. I think all of us when we're young look for models and mentors, heroes and heroines, people that we can try to emulate individuals that give us the sense that all things are possible, that with a little luck and with a lot of assistance and the right kind of social support group, we can make our mark in history, whether we're ever recognized for that or not. I have been teaching since I stepped down as president a course, a seminar, on biography and autobiography. And I'm in the process of now writing the third volume of a three-part memoir. So in a sense, I've been reliving my life. And I've begun, be, begun to be more astute in recognizing the individuals who were models for me along the way. Of course, my parents and family members, some extraordinary teachers that I had in grade school and high school not to speak, of course, at Notre Dame and beyond. Individuals who were my coacher, coaches and mentors, advisors, and those that I only admired at a distance. And so when I began to teach this course on biography and autobiography, it gave me an opportunity to try to decide whose lives are worth studying and why do we care in the first place. I don't know, those of you who are in the youngest generation here, who your models are, who you admire up close and personal or from a distance. But one of the attempts I'd like to make tonight is to give you some examples of people that I have that kind of relationship with personally. Now, I could talk about a lot of individuals I'm not going to mention tonight. What about the holy saints of the church? Thomas More, to do the right thing for the right reason, the model for lawyers and judges. Or I could think St. Francis of Assisi, maybe the most popular saint in Christian history, who's kind of the model for ecological sensitivity, simplicity of life, speaking words of critique, to the power brokers of the day. I could think about all kinds of holy women and men, including in our own country's history. And there are many secular heroes as well. Amelia Earhart, the first successful and famous woman flyer. Marie Curie, winner of two Nobel Prizes for science. Benazir, Benazir Bhutto, the first woman who functioned as a prime minister of a predominantly Muslim country. You could think of Mahatma Gandhi, the great founder of modern Israel, of modern India, who was appalled by the violence that happened in the time of transition and who was martyred tragically at the end of his political career. But what I'd like to do tonight in, in a brief fashion is to talk about three individuals who are highly known, well known for their accomplishments and three people you've never heard of. And my goal is to have you think differently 
about the people you encounter in your family, in your neighborhood, in, in this college, and those that you may look at at a distance who have qualities, virtues, things that are worth emulating that you might fashion your life after. For why does a college like this exist in the first place? Not simply to provide a high quality education and to give you experiences that you wouldn't have otherwise, but to draw your attention to the future, to kind of project yourself into various possible lives that would be worthy of you and there would be opportunities for you to take your God-given talents and, as I said before, make your mark, whether quietly or to great public acclaim. So first of all, the three individuals I draw your attention to. Abraham Lincoln. By popular judgment, the greatest American president. Now, I'm the 16th president of Notre Dame, and he was the 16th president of the United States. We're both tall. That's all we had in common. And I haven't been assassinated yet. But I'm a kind of Lincoln file. I've read huge amounts about him, and I have a high regard for him. But he wasn't a perfect specimen by any means. We know that Lincoln came from humble background. He was a reader, but he had almost no books. So he read the same ones over and over again, like the Bible and the collected works of Shakespeare and a few of the pieces of literature that had begun to circulate that had an American origin. And Lincoln, in his oratory and in his sense of humor, drew on a regular basis from that foundation, which is in one sense to prove that depth of education in many ways is more important than breadth of education. He got it. He was a learner, a lifelong learner. And he was somebody who wasn't that successful as a politician running for office. He was elected to Congress once as a representative but not re-elected. It was almost by accident that he became a candidate for President of the United States. And then on, at face value, Stephen Douglas, who he engaged in debates for before his uh, eventual election, was on solid grounds much more qualified than Abraham Lincoln ever was. And he wasn't what you would call somebody by background who was open to the full dignity of the African American person. Nothing about his background would have prepared him for the role that he eventually played as the great emancipator. But we can honor him because he learned from his experience. When he was elected president, his first goal was to keep the nation together above all else even if it meant tolerating the evil of slavery for a time. But as the war progressed, he became more and more courageous in recognizing the horror that was the enslavement of black people in this country. And so he became the advocate. And his Emancipation Proclamation, in the midst of the horror of the American Civil War, where over 600,000 people died on both sides, was one of the most prophetic proclamations in the history of the country and world. Lincoln was subject to bouts of depression his whole life. He lost two of his children, young children, while he was alive. He mourned their absence deeply. It affected his ability to sleep and to focus on the task at hand. When he became president, he decided he wanted to be available to everyone. 
in the White House was chaos. Every day when he would come down there, there were seekers of privilege, people looking for a job, people trying to get their, their husbands or sons out of difficulty in the military. And yet he tolerated all of that. His marriage, you might say, was less than successful. His wife subject to bouts of mental illness herself. After the death of their first son, in a sense they mourned for months together. He had served in the military, but he really had no battlefield experience. In the, in the course of the American Civil War, he had to train himself, and he went out to battlefields, often at great personal risk, in order to try to get the general, generals to get the job done. He almost didn't get reelected the second time. In fact, his second election very much depended on the troops being able to vote because he was popular with them. And yet in the end, when he was assassinated at the Ford Theater, he had the most emotionally engaged funeral in the history of the country. Thousands and thousands of people wanted to visit him when he lay in state in the White House in the Capitol. And then they took his body on a train from Washington up through New York, across Ohio, into Indiana, to Chicago, and down to Springfield, Illinois, where he was buried. It provided an opportunity for the nation to mourn the loss of so many lives and to celebrate what he had been able to achieve. This man of humble origin, one of my great heroes. The second example is another obvious one, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, born in Albania, kind of not one of the most visited countries in the world, well-educated, joined a religious community of women, and she was assigned to teach upper-class Indian girls in Calcutta. She was good at it, devoted, prayerful, but every time she would look outside of the school walls, and every time she would walk through the streets of Calcutta, she'd see all these people dying on the streets with nobody to take care of them. It's troubled her deeply. And so, little by little, she began to think, well, maybe God is calling me to do something about this. They're not Christians, they're Hindus and Muslims, but they're God's children, and I need to tend to them somehow. So she began to volunteer doing that. And gradually, she was able to attract some of the wealthy women, most of whom were not Christian either, to accompany her. And gradually, she got permission from the Vatican to form her own religious community. She started by providing humane treatment of the dying, the kind of dregs of Indian society in the eyes of many, to give them the tactile comfort of some other human agent being present in their lives. And then, of course, as her community began to grow, she took on some of the other issues, HIV, AIDS, homelessness, chronic poverty, hunger, and little by little, she began to be recognized as a holy woman, and her community spread, and I've had a chance to be with them in various parts of the world. When she died, there were millions of people mainly non-Christians, who participated in her funeral. It was televised, not only in India, but all over the world. And a, a couple of years later, they published a memoir that she kept along the way. And she revealed that much of that time she had a kind of spiritual emptiness. It wasn't like she was 
always aware of God's comforting presence in the midst of some of the most complicated ministry available, but rather that God would provide. She knew the cross. She knew human emptiness in the face of touching with love and full humanity some of the outcasts of society. My third example is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela actually was born into fairly privileged circumstances in tribal society in South Africa, despite its apartheid tradition. Nelson Mandela was tutored to be a leader among his people. He was given a chance for education in a mission school of the Methodist. And little by little, he developed the kind of personal capacity and educational background that in most places would have qualified him for leadership of the country. But because of the, the laws of the time which proscribed blacks from having a chance for that opportunity, he began to get involved with various protest movements, including for a while the possibility of using, using violence to overturn the governor, the government. And because of that, eventually he was thrown into jail for what proved to be decades. And because of his friends who made him a representative of those who stood for freedom for all peoples in South Africa, Eventually, the government had to ease on the conditions in the prison. And as worldwide protests continued, and he was, in a sense, the face of it all, he was able eventually to be released from jail. And after experiencing all of this horror for so long, the surprising everyone, when elections were held, Nelson Mandela became the first black president of contemporary South Africa. The whites all thought, well, he's going to kick everybody out and form some kind of race-based dictatorship. But he fooled them all once again. He kept people in place. He established agencies of reconciliation. As long as someone admitted the horrible things they had done under apartheid, they were allowed to continue to function in society and not be imprisoned. And he began to be one of the great human representatives of what leadership is all about. Learning to forgive and to forget. Not simply naively, but to reconstruct a society in a way that everyone can feel they have a part and have a sense of belonging. You've heard of all those three. So let me continue by giving some examples of three people I know that I have the same regard for, even though you've never heard of them. The first one is named Ohm. Ohm. I was teaching a class to my first year seminar, and we were reading a book about the Nazi Holocaust in Germany. And Ohm was in the class, and she said one day, when we were beginning the discussion of the book, I couldn't get past page 47. I go, why not? Because it reminded me of my experience in Cambodia. And she told her story. She came from fairly privileged background, and when Pol Pot, who was a vicious dictator, started a kind of Marxist revolution, in Cambodia and wanted to basically destroy all of the educated and those who had had power in the past, her family was separated and she was given custody of her one-year-old brother. And she was in a concentration camp and they were living on one tablespoonful of rice a day. And eventually her brother died in her arms and she was all by herself. But in God's good time, Om was released and able to go to the refugee camps in Thailand. And she was reunited with her family, moved to Minneapolis, 
Minnesota. And after 10 years of not being in school, she went to a school there. And now she was sitting in my class, and somebody said to her after she recounted her story, how could you tell that so dispassionately? And she said, how do you think I survived all of those years? I learned to control my emotions, and I learned how to survive. Well, Ohm finished the class, graduated from Notre Dame, began to work for the Ford Motor Company. She had spent some time in Japan on a study abroad program. Then she said to me, I'd like to get in to, one of a, to do a PhD in international economics. I said, she said, what school, I said, what school do you want to go to? She said, MIT, that's the best. She said, I'll never get in there. I said, trust me, you'll get in. So I wrote one of the best letters I've ever written, knowing that everybody else who knew her was going to write a great letter too. She got in, got her PhD, and now she's the first member of her extended family, not just to go to college, but to have a PhD and to be functioning as somebody looking at the big picture that affects so many people in the world today. The second student was in my class. His name was Alex. He was born in Colombia with one arm and no legs. His relatives wanted to have him aborted or killed when he was young. His mother wouldn't think of it. But here he was in a place where they didn't have the medical capacity to help him. One arm, no legs. So one of his relatives was in Southern California, in San Diego. And they arranged his mother had to give him up. He went to San Diego. And they were able, in one of the Shriner hospitals, to rig him up with prostheses for his legs and arm. So he's in my class with three prostheses and all kinds of energy and enthusiasm. And the class is really taken with them. But he says to the class, you know, this is when we had an administration building with no elevator. And our class was on the third floor. He says, I can't really get up the steps with my bags. So he worked out having members of the class help him up the steps with the bags. Then he says, you know, these doors, they have knobs. You got a prosthesis, you can't open a knobby door. So we figured out how to handle that one. But what he began to do is to teach us about the circumstances that most of us would never personally encounter. So our seminar was enriched by his presence. He aspired, he always wanted to work for the San Diego Padres. So he moved to San Diego, got a job. He kept applying to the Padres. You need me. I'm your guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back the next time. He did that for five years. Then they said, well, let's hire this guy. They hired him, and now he's a vice president for community relations for the San Diego Padres. And the last one I want to tell you about is named Haley. I didn't know Haley until I was lying in a hotel bed in Washington, D.C., and I got the phone call that our women's swim team was in a tragic accident on the Indiana Toll Road in a blizzard. Two had been killed and 18 hurt. I flew back. I saw the crash site. I went to the health center. I saw those who were injured, and then I went down to the hospital, and I saw Haley's parents, and they said, she can't move anything. We're hopeful that she'll move a toe or a finger and maybe that'll be a sign that she'll get some functioning. Otherwise, she's going to be a paraplegic for the rest of her life. I went in. What do you say to somebody in that condition? I said, Haley, I hope, I know you're getting the best medical condition. I'll pray for you. I'm going to come visit you tomorrow and as, every day as long as I can. I came back the next day. She had moved a finger. Well, eventually with a lot of surgery, including a rod in her back, she was able to get out of the hospital. And I was there when she swam again. She won her heat. Unbelievable. She was back swimming again. And then eventually, she graduated, she married, she has two children, and she's a teacher and coach in Annapolis, Maryland. And she wrote a book about her experience, and so did Alex. 
and I used those books in my class. And, and Haley came to my class, and the students were blown away by her. So one of the students said to Haley, you look like you're pretty healthy. Do you have any pain? She says, yeah, sure I have pain. I've just learned to live with it. That's what you do when you've been through what I've been through. But it's a whole lot better than the alternatives were. Last week, the University of Notre Dame announced that Haley Scott was going to be this year's commencement speaker. Who would ever have thought? So, do you know people, not so dramatic, those are dramatic stories. Do you know people here at St. Joseph? Do you know people in your family? I have so many people I've met along the way who I think are heroes and heroines, who are good spouses and dedicated and loving parents, who are in the professions, who are running businesses that provide jobs for others, who are involved in good government, who are taking on some of the great policy issues of the day, who are volunteers, Every one of us has our own special story, our own call from God. Mine, as a priest, came when I was on a mountaintop in Mexico in a service project. I just had a sense God was calling me to that. And I've counseled so many other people along the way. You can't count on a mountaintop experience, but you can use your own way of making decisions. Use your mind and your heart and your sensitivities and your experience and then say what would I like to do what would I like to be what's God calling me to and if we can do that the depressing news we get about priests who violated their vows about academics who cheated about government leaders who are corrupt about business leaders that have built their investors. We can get overwhelmed by the negative news. But I want to claim, especially maybe in this Easter season, which is full of hope and possibility, that we can also see the positive side of things. That we can be inspired by people who have lived worthy lives, who've taken on challenges, who've realized some of their goals. Some of them will never be known by others. But as long as we have a few that we can identify, it can make all the difference for us. It can sustain us. It can inspire us. It can encourage us. So that's why I think heroes and heroines are very consistent with the theme of this 100th anniversary of this great college. Those of you who are students here and those who assist this process, what are you going to do with your life? Who are you going to be a hero and heroine for? How are you going to give back what you've already received? That's the challenge all of us face. Good luck and God willing to us all. I'm used to running seminars, so I could just go row to row, but I won't unless you make me. Some of you are here because you're in classes that said you should be here, so you better stand out from the crowd for your grades here. So, All right, so somebody uh, either uh, asked me about something central to the notion of heroes and heroines, or uh, anybody I've made reference to, or do you have an example yourself of somebody you'd like to uh, tell me the story about? I'd like to hear that too. So, anybody want to start? First one is the hardest to get going here. Yes. You can use mine. I, I just want to mention our own Sister Ann Fitzpatrick. Uh, Ann has MS, and she's had it for a number of years. She can't move anything. Uh, finger, uh, head, nothing. Uh, 
one day I was at the mother house where she was living and they had put her out in a wheelchair and because uh, she loves the outdoors so uh, I was in retreat you're not supposed to talk but I decided I would ask her if she needed anything and she said I think there's an ant calling up my leg so I pulled up her skirt and looked I didn't want to go too far and uh, I, I said no there's no ant there she said yes there is she said look again and I did and sure enough there was an ant now sister at this time is at St. Joseph's Manor uh, I used to tell her that she would go straight to heaven because of her condition but now she has a motorized a wheelchair and she makes it go by moving her mouth this way or that way to back up and uh, she gets around so I said well maybe she'll make it to heaven that is and uh, her work is going around visiting the people in the nursing home and she certainly is a hero to me that's a great story That really gets us into the spirit of it, because, you know, I, I, I don't want to just bore you with people I know, but I want to encourage you to think about people you know, and to be able to tell their stories to, the, to others who would benefit from them. Anybody else got a good story like that? Yes. I could just build for a second on that. Uh, when I got involved in this uh, organ transplantation thing, uh, my motivation was I wanted to help my my nephew. Uh, and I got a call about three weeks beforehand, and they said, would you and your nephew be willing to do a swap? I thought, why would we want to do a swap? Because we were compatible with each other. But what it allowed was a mother and son who were incompatible with each other but compatible with us the son had a 30 year old kidney for my 40 year old nephew and my, the woman the mother was 60 and I was 67 so I was able we were able to, to do this and we were the first as far as we know the first uh, swap of a pa compatible and incompatible pair in human history now I don't want to tell you this because of that experience but I've, I've given talks around the country and I've met all these people and the, the ones that I I'm so blown away by are those that have no connection to anyone. They just decide, having read about organ transplantation, that they're willing to give a kidney to help someone else. And what happens often when they do that is it sets in place a train of swaps around the country. So the New York Times Magazine section about four weeks ago had a front page cover story about 50 people. 25 couples, and it all started with one guy who said, you know, I've been reading about this kidney transplantation thing. You only need one. So what's the one? Why, why do we have two if you only need one? So you can give one away. Anyway, that's the line I like to use. Uh, and so I've met all these amazing people who have stepped up because they wanted to do good in a physically tangible way with a major organ. So. And then as a result of that, all these people, because of modern surgery, have been able to assist one another who weren't compatible, but were motivated because they had a relationship with someone. So what it does, it, it draws all these loops of connection that people would never have recognized. And so those people are real heroes and heroines to me 
who step out of the blue and say, I'm willing to do this. Uh, and as a result, a lot of people are positively impacted. How about anybody else? Another example or a question or anything to keep us attentive, as they say. Yes. Father, thank you. Is this on? You're right. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. I brought my class with me, and I wasn't sure. I graduated from Marquette, so I was not sure I should it's a go. It's school in the Midwest somewhere. A little bit or of question about whether or not I should bring them or not, but I, I'm glad I'm glad they came. Um, so for the sake of synthesis uh, yes. with, with my class here, um, I noticed that all of your all of your examples overcame personal tragedies, um, di difficult obstacles, obstacles that in many other cases um, would have just ground people you know right into the ground, and yet these individuals rose above them. Is there some sort of and, and I have I have my own ideas about this, but some sort of um, traits or characteristics that you would say were common to those individuals that we could take away when we're faced with obstacles or challenges, um, that we could face them in the same way that they face them. One of the things that strikes me in studying or, or learning about individuals that I've uh, mentioned along the way uh, was their utter humility. Um, a sense that what they did wasn't more than all, everyone was called to. And I, I think the people that have been through the worst level of deprivation have also recognized as a result of that that we're all in this together. Like Alex, the guy that was born with one leg and no arms. Um, he could have been killed when he was a baby abandoned, whatever. Uh, he could have been stuck in, in what was a circumstance that he wouldn't have had prostheses. He had to have a relative willing to welcome him. Uh, the Shriner organization, which raises money to keep these hospitals going, had to see him as a worthy candidate. Uh, then uh, he had to take his education seriously in order, with lim some limitations, to be able to go to Notre Dame. And then, later on, uh, he began, uh, he, he always wanted to be a leader. He was a leader in the dorm he lived in. He was a campus leader in organization. So he didn't let any of that hold him back. But he wasn't in your face. And he was never uh, begging for sympathy. So that's why uh, somebody like him, for me, uh, manifests a kind of utter humility combined with a kind of drive. Where does that drive come from, that inner purpose, that desire to, uh, to let the spark of life grow in you and uh, give you the courage to do great things? Uh, it's just when you meet people like that, I think it boosts all of us. I mean, don't we all have our bad moments and our failures and people don't understand us and I thought I could do more than that? Or uh, you Just think about all the people at any given moment that have plenty to complain about. But what these people did not do was sit back and complain. There's a great story about Nelson Mandela when he was at, right, at, at uh, I keep thinking of Rikers Island, that's in New York, Robin Island, Robin Island, yeah. And, and he was there all those years. And at first, they, they wanted him, there, there were certain things the guards wanted to make them do, and he refused. He said, My digni the dignity of, that I have and the dignity of the people I'm with, we will not do that. Wear these pants. We, we, we demand at least a minimal level of self-worth acknowledged by you. He learned Afrikaans so he could communicate with the guards. And he, in fact, became very popular with the guards, even though many, some of them were very cruel to the black prisoners there. And so he was an example of somebody who was, in a sense, creative and responding to his life circumstance. He didn't let the circumstances overwhelm him. He was able to adjust accordingly and yet still keep that sense of dignity and worth that carried him on to, of course, leading the nation. So I think we find examples like that that all of us uh, hope that we'll have the courage to do the same thing in, in our own good time. Yes, anybody else? How are we doing? want to 
yell from there? Or you want to? Very good story. Thank you. I, the younger generation probably doesn't know much about the the stories about Saint Christopher, since they he kind of got left out of the recent Saint book. But anyway, the whole notion of Christopher was he would help people that came up to the stream and carry him on his shoulder, carry them across. Came, uh, there was a there's a movement called the Christopher movement, and uh, the theme of which was light a candle instead of cursing the dark or something like that, and uh, and the whole notion was that you never know who plays various roles in human history, you know who's the Christ for others and. And so the, the Christopher movement was find something good that you can do and, and do it because it's not only good for others, but someday there but for the grace of God go I. You never know when your circumstances will change. One of the things about a dawn economy, people that were used to doing relatively well and having a, a job and a thriving potential future all of a sudden find themselves out of work and it's they, they, they sense they've lost their dignity and, and their belonging and are, are the outcast of somehow of society. And that's a reminder uh, when these tornadoes go through a, a place or a hurricane or some kind of natural disaster like New Orleans, all of a sudden you find yourself in circumstances just the opposite of what you were accustomed to. And then you have great need. And so those of us who have the capacity to respond, that's one of the great motivators, I think, because there but for the grace of God go I. You never know. Natural disasters come out of the blue, and, and we're hopeful and thankful when somebody comes along to help us. Anyone else? We'll keep this within the assigned limit, but... These guys are really worried. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I guess I've never really had anything devastating happened to me, but I guess I want to know, like, how, if it doesn't happen, how people can, how can you train people to have that humility, you know, like, you don't need, you don't need, like, this devastating event in your life, and it's so simple, you know, to be that humble and just a good person, but I just don't know why, like, I think I was talking uh, with with Ed uh, at, at dinner tonight about the service activity that many of you do. My some of the richest things I've done in my own personal life 
have been to, to engage with people whose circumstances were different from my own. And, and a, the more a variety of those that we can do, the more we recognize, on one hand, how fortunate we may have been, and then how little some other people had control over their circumstances. I've told this story before, but maybe it's apropos. There was a group of Notre Dame students in the summertime that were assigned to a, a homeless center in Atlanta, Georgia. And the job they were given was to interview all the guests at the center and to assign them to categories to explain why they were homeless. So they would have mentally ill, lost the job, sick, uh, had limited education, or it could be whatever. Whatever you think are the causes of homelessness. And then, all of a sudden, they met two people that changed their notion. They were both Notre Dame grads. How could a Notre Dame grad be homeless in Atlanta? And they heard their stories, and all of a sudden they had a different notion of how vulnerable all of us could be given that same kind of personal history. And it was a great motivator for them, not simply to assign people to categories, but to be open to listening to their story and not writing them off, but trying to empathize with them. And then to figure out what could I do to be of assistance to them. So provision of housing was one, but also help people to think about preparing for uh, the workforce, uh, more than temporary housing, permanent housing, and that sort of thing. And so that's what a lot of people that come through colleges like St. Joseph go out in the world and start to do. In addition to your primary task, which is take care of, of the job that you're assigned or that you have, and your family if you have one, it's also being a good citizen and a good member of the church community if you are, are so involved. And then that gives the opportunity, drawing upon your early experience, to be open in a fresh way to what you can learn from people like those that are different from yourself. And that's the great advantage about going abroad, spending time in other parts of the world, um, being in, in places that, that have a lifestyle and a set of cultural values different from our own. And then you say, well, maybe the whole world's not like what I'm used to. And then hopefully you can learn from that as well. Anyway, I think we've hit our eight o'clock time. And, uh, I'll be happy to hang around if any of you have stories to share or any questions to ask. I thank you for your time and attention. Go Monks! Thank you. Thank you, Father Malloy, for those inspiring words and for being part of our centennial celebration here at St. Joseph's. Uh, we hope that uh, the folks who heard you this evening will take the, uh, the words that you've offered to heart and continue the tradition here at uh, St. Joseph's uh, in our mercy tradition of caring for other people. And thank you to Ed for, for reaching out to Father Malloy. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Thank you.